say, I'm going to do this. But that's not the way it works with broad form learning. And so, uh, like I say, the uh, study of Kentucky outlawed it later on in West Virginia did too. And, and what they now require, they can still get their minerals, but what they now require is that they pay the landowners for any damage done to the property. Okay, so here are some contrast mining methods. So on the left, we have the deep mines that you're probably not familiar with. There's surface mining techniques on the right, and at the top you see mountaintop removal, and uh, down below uh, you have a uh, bench type mining, and I'll show you some pictures of old bench, bench mining a little bit later on. Auger mining is where they take a great big drill bit and drill into the coal, which is fairly soft, and pull it out. And then you have what are called drag lines. And they grow along long walls and they pull the coal out uh, from the seams that have been exposed. Now, notice what happens to the rocks for it. Here in Mount Top Removal, or any of these other things, it is now legal for the spoil to be pushed down into the valleys and you biologists know this, or geologists too, that in the bottom of valleys, there are usually what? Water, sure. Okay, so you're talking about a tremendous amount of water pollution uh, due to strip mining. And this was actually not legal uh, until George Bush figured out a way to bypass the rules and allow for mountaintop removal, and now, of course, we have the problems we have today. Next slide. So surface mining is quite damaging to the environment, and I guess it would be the American way to think about this, good old USA, that the local people are benefiting greatly from these activities, but if you look at that map a little earlier, you'll see that most of its mountaintop removal is taking place in areas that have the highest poverty rates. Now this is not anything new. This was true of deep mining as well. The greatest amount of poverty was in those areas where mining took place. Now, I took this picture from my airplane back in 1970. Again, I apologize for being a little bit fuzzy, but you see these streaks here? Back at this time, if a fellow had a bulldozer, they take that bulldozer and they swallow a seam of coal, which will hold it on, and follow that seam of coal around the mountain. And then, of course, put it in their truck and hauled off to be sold. So a lot of damage was done in 1970, as you can see from old strip mining. This is the Cumberland Mountains that run between Tennessee and Kentucky. Next. So again, on mountaintop removal, push the mountain over, or take the top of the mountain, put it over into the spoil, uh, put the spoil into the valley, and essentially what you've got here is a level mountain, and of course, lots of debris in the valley. And I've got another picture that will just astound you on that. Next. So here's a beautiful uh, mountain area in Virginia. Thanks.
questions while we're waiting? On <laughs> technology, one time. Yes, for Robert Bird of West Virginia, ought to be ought to wield a good bit of power. In well, he's dead. Yeah, but why why was that power utilized? There has never been a major politician in the state of West Virginia that has been willing to correct some of the local problems that happen as a result of mining. And most recently, Jay Rockefeller came out in support of Mount Top removal. So that gives you some idea. And this has been going on for a long time. Yeah, one governor after another in the state of West Virginia in the 20th century was, was either a former coal, uh, employee, many lawyers, of coal companies or railways. And they, of course, were the, were the principal people benefiting from this activity. The coal company off residence resided mostly in Pittsburgh, where the steel making was. And so a lot of the coal mine went into steel. So here we have a mountain, and the mountain is in the process of disappearing. Next. Is that the same mountain? No, it's not the same mountain I'll show you. It's similar, but it's not exactly the same mountain. I'll talk a little bit later about the economics of, uh, of coal mining as it applies to local residents. Yeah. Okay, so you can see a lot on Google Earth. <laughs> Excellent. So if you want to see strip mine areas, just take a tour through Central Appalachia. In Perry County, Appalachia, and nearby Martin County in particular, Martin County has a per capita income of $10,000 a year. Per capita, average. $10,000 a year. So yeah, is this activity really benefiting the people? Locally, not much. Now, I will say this on the side of the coal company, and that is there is now, there wasn't before 1972 in Kentucky, a uh, uh, capitation tax on coal. That was originally done by taxes years and years ago. They had a capitation tax on oil, which means that every gallon or barrel of oil that left Texas had a certain amount of tax going back to the to the state. Then of course since 1972 you have Kentucky having a capitation tax and also uh, in West Virginia later on in the mid 80s. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania has no capitation tax and of course they have been stripped mine longer than, than these other states. Um, so, yeah. so where does that capitation tax go? Some of it goes back into uh, paying for the damage that the uh, coal companies do, but the damage that the coal companies do don't nearly pay, uh, or that is the taxes don't nearly pay for the damage that the coal companies actually do. And of course, the states have have to say in in, in how that uh, tax money is is spent out. All right, here's Cabin Creek, West Virginia. Some of you old guys like Carl, ever heard of Jerry West? He's from here. Now, notice that strip mine is right beside one. <laughs> There's a river. Okay. Now, when the rains come down on strip mine soil. Strip mine soil generally has a lot of minerals in it, including manganese, sulfur. Sulfur bacteria eat the sulfur as a process of what we call in biology chemosynthesis. And that chemosynthetic activity produces sulfur oxide, and the sulfur oxide reacts with rainwater, and that goes into the stream. I stopped at a roadside park in Kentucky in 19. Um, 71 and actually tested a stream I saw running through the park in uh, south, uh, southeast Kentucky and the pH was 3.5. Now if you know about pH, that's in the neighborhood of Edgar. And of course there wasn't anything living in the water. 
And that is from that was from old mine drainage, including deep mine. So next one, please. I'll wave at you. Over. <laughs> Do y'all have any questions? Do you have any law? I the coal company is responsible for paying the capitation tax. Yes. And it goes to the local government. It goes to the state treasury. And it's supposed to be used to pay for the damage, but. Uh, well, there's not enough of to pay for all of that. It since it goes to the general uh, treasury, it, it goes to a lot of different activities. And, and if you if you just want to know, well, why do you need a capitation tax? Just compare the style of living, the, the standard of living in, in southeastern Kentucky with Texas. Some people had the foresight in Texas to do that. So here is Wise County, uh, Virginia, which is about uh, this particular mine is about 20 miles away from where my grandparents grew up. And you can see the amount of damage there. There, next. No questions? Why? We don't want to answer questions, but I'm particularly interested. You go ahead. 89% of the sites have been reclaimed, and yet most of what you're showing. No, 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 no. 89% have not been reclaimed. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, reclamation is not really putting it back like it was originally. And, and, and I'm going to talk uh, more about this. Now, look at this Hobbit mine in West Virginia. This, this is a time thing. So we'll look at it in 1984. And the next slide we're going to see here is what it looks like in 2009, if it ever comes up. There's a question. Yes. Uh, you said that Bush found a way to get around uh, not being able to do. Yeah, in 1977, there was a Surface Mining Reclamation Act that passed. And basically, before the Bush administration, it was illegal to push the top of the mountain into the valleys because of water pollution rules. So basically, what Bush did was this. this uh, suspend the rules of water pollution so that mountaintop removal could then proceed. Which bush are we talking about? That's all I said. I he just suspended the rules. Uh, a water pollution rule would apply to that. Which, of course, the president is responsible for regulatory rules. That's what government does. That's one. Are we talking Bush Senior or? We're talking about the W. I understand that. Uh, uh, um, on the news recently, um, maybe less than a year ago, Obama had some sort of law that affected uh, mountaintop removals, but I'm not really sure what it was. Well, he wanted to institute a new policy, and as a matter of fact, the coal companies are in a major uproar because there's one site where they wanted to do mountaintop removal that Obama has prevented them from doing so. Actually, not Obama, it's EPA. EPA said that they may not um, uh, do this, and this is the Arch Coal Company site in West Virginia. Um, so they're really in an uproar about that. Of course, anything, they attack anything vigorously. The sharks are in the water when you try to attack their profit margin in any way. So here's the Hobbit Mine 2008. <coughs> Same picture. Next. I like this question. <laughs> How many different mining companies are there? Well, there are a lot of them. There are some that are a lot bigger than others. The major ones is Maxie Coal Company and Arch. 
Now, look at this. So, mountaintop removal, right? After snow, by the way. That's where you find white. Look at this. Would you like to estimate how deep that valley field is? That's a field. That's a field. That's deep. It's a field. So, here we have something that's uh, probably about 100 feet foot mile deep in terms of a field. Then you see a little water coming out of the base of it. And that water has got a lot of acid in it. It's got a lot of other uh, iron, iron minerals in it. Uh, basically, the water tends to look either bright red if it's um, acid water coming out of the base of, of the field. Well, it's a little bit more on the basic side. You have iron hydroxide, which in the mountains they call yellow ore. And it comes out of the base. Next. So, 
uh, in addition to obviously losing habitat or things like birds, you also lose habitat for, and this is, an Appalachian cottontail bunny. Okay. And of course, for just a fact, you know, they say time, timing is everything in comedy, so. <laughs> It's got to be the reverse of that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bob. Okay. Oh, sorry. Next. So, y'all have any more questions? Fire away. Now, local residents. Look at that stuff coming out. Let's see. The water coaches for the whole thing. Excuse me? I don't think that's drinkable the water coaches. <laughs> <laughs> you know, recently, this is one of the foolish, most foolish things that so, a state senator in West Virginia actually took a bottle of this and went to a committee meeting and drank it to show everybody it wouldn't kill them immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. Oh, Jeez. What are they doing now? Well, give them 20 years. <laughs> you know, mutations don't happen all of a sudden. But anyway, next. <laughs> um. So I guess they live on bottled water. Excuse me? They live on bottled water. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, the churches, you saw that guy that, that was a representative from, uh, from the Christians. Now, uh, the churches. Uh, for instance, Maria, in fact, you may have heard of some here at I 75. They go to college there, and uh, they actually um, uh, donate money to be paid for a bottle of water to be then sent down into Perry County and Martin County to help the people with the quality water supplies. Uh, yes, the question. Um, with everything that's in in the ground, coal and everything, I mean, are there, can they access, have they been able to access in the past, can they still access deep water wells, groundwater there? Oh, the, you, you, I mean, that's a big deal. Because the deep water wells are thoroughly polluted by okay, so it's the leaching, water is leaching down the field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The wells are gone. Let me tell you a little story here. Way back when I first came to Georgia, there was a raging debate. And the raging debate was over the development of the salt marshes on the Georgia coast. There was one group of people saying, okay, we want to buy up the land and we want to put in real estate development where you have the salt marsh areas. Cheap land, buy it up, develop it, sell it for a lot of money. But then Eugene Odom, who was at the University of Georgia, who wrote the ecology book I used in school, he came for the legislature and explained that if they filled in the marsh uh, uh, lands, like it's been many times done in, for instance, New Jersey, that they're going to lose off into the future fishing. So the stream, uh, the fishing industry, which is very important uh, activity along the coast and catching the shrimp, somewhere like that, that would essentially disappear if you remove, remove the marsh grass. Now, what's behind that? Well, the marsh grass provides what we call a decomposition food chain. The marsh grass decomposes, then uh, bacteria break it down, then algae come in, and then you get into food chains. And it turns out that, for instance, your shrimp, the shrimp live in and around the marsh uh, grass, particularly the early stages of them. And then certain fishes, like flounder, for instance, you may have had at home, uh, also depend on the marsh ecosystem. So you, you said, okay, you destroy it now, and then look off in the future at the economic effects. Now that's a very important principle, because what's going on in shrimp is the destruction 
of farmland. People know the best place to put a farm is beside a stream in a valley because occasionally it floods and it puts good soil, replenishes soil in the floodplain, natural floodplain of the stream. Now, what about homeowners? Well, here's a guy with a boulder in his house. <laughs> it's not bad invitation. Now, when these big explosions go off, you saw initially, they blow things up into the air. Sometimes the big boulders come down and squash cars. I used to have a picture of a car squash there for that loss of some preparation. But uh, they also roll into homes. Next. Now this is a case that's in the court right The AG Coal Company is being sued for two and a half, actually 2.54, there, uh, million dollars because what happened? Well, the mining operation up here and the roads that they're using here under construction, a big boulder rolled down and hit the Davidson house and killed the little boy. Next. Now let's talk a little bit about economics. Obviously, there are many economic effects of coal mining, but the point that I tried to make here earlier is the effects are largely transmitted outside the areas where the coal was mined. And the term that we used to use for that is non-resident owners. We don't actually live in the area. And what you find is, of course, effects can be divided. We look at pre-strip mining of coal. So this is when the deep mining of coal was uh, was the only way, mostly, that coal was extracted. What did you have? You had a tradition of poor working conditions for many deep miners. Anybody ever heard of Loretta Lynn? The country music song? Well, her father died in Butcher Hollow. You've ever heard of singing that song? And he died of black lung disease. So many of the miners inhaled coal dust. And now by rule, the coal dust has to be sprayed out of the air with water as the miners are working so that they won't inhale. But sometimes coal companies skirt the rules. And you have big accidents like happened recently where you have you know, 10, 28 miners killed in coal explosions when the coal companies don't follow the federal rules. So why don't they follow the federal rules? Well, this is a game that's been going on since Reagan, and that is the way that the, the, the companies get control of what's going on in the mine and avoid the rule is to encourage the government to not have enough inspectors. So if you don't have enough people to inspect, the mines, then you get a situation where the owners many times uh, uh, get away with them. So, why so poor working conditions? And by the way, if you ever want to see a, 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 a film that gets in a little bit about this, there's an old film called Make One, M-A-T-E-W-A-N. Make One's an excellent film to see. It's been on Netflix. So, why? Keep costs down so coal is cheap. Outcome. Thousands of miners die under exposure by lung disease. Benefits pass to non-resident owners so that the areas stay poor. Heavily mined areas remain poor. And continuing. After the beginning of strip mining, strip mining employs a small number of people. So in Gary, West Virginia, for instance, in 1955, 
there were over 1,400 coal miners. Just 40 years later, there were only 400 coal miners. What was the beginning of that? 1,400. Not a bad number, of course, but, but I, I lived there. We used to play Gary and football. So, enormous profits are made, and certainly, particularly Mount Top removal. Very few people are employed. So again, you see, well, okay, well, a few people are benefited by this, but what about the rest of the locals? That's the question. There are a few economic benefits to them, but most of them are staying in poverty in certain areas. So, next. Yeah, going past this. I don't know why we lost. So, streams and floodplains are polluted. They proceed through the field. Homes cannot be built on the fields for some time because of what we call settling or subsidence. Bridges, bridges and roads are broken by overweight coal trucks. That's been going on for a long time. So when you pick up the coal in the at the top of the mountain and haul it down the roads to break the roads into pieces. Guess who paid for those broken roads? The general taxpayer did. So, basically what you have is a passing off of coal extraction, and if you factor into that the health cost of burning coal, you see the coal is really an activity that passes a lot of the cost of this not only mining but it's burning to the general citizens. Next. This water coming out of the, the, the filler, you know, if it gets into such, uh, uh, treatment plants and then distributed to the people, basically what happens over a long period of time is that the pipes in the house fill up with deposits. Brine. And so periodically they have to replace that kind of, uh, their plumbing or, or their toilet uh, mechanism. So here's an example of an overweight coal truck going over, uh, over a bridge. <laughs> the truck weighs much, much more than, of course, the bridge says it allows. So what happens to these poverty stricken areas? A lot of people move out. Non-resident owners benefits, keeps the lights on in Atlanta. And I'll push it off on all of us now. Come on, guys. How much are we willing to pay for this luxury of energy? Is it worth destroying Appalachia? I think that's a moral question. Especially in light of the fact that we could create more jobs with clean energy technologies. So that begs the next question. Next. You've heard about it. It's called clean coal. Skip on to 34. I don't know why I did that. So what is clean coal? First clean coal uh, commercial I saw about eight years ago, it was an eagle, a bald eagle, American symbol, flying through the air, and they started talking about clean coal. And they've been talking in commercials about clean coal. Now recently the commercials have changed a little bit, and they say, well, we got, we want to develop this technology for clean coal. Please let us do that. I don't know who to stop them. But clean coal, a working technology for carbon capture is only operable in Denmark. Now, would you do that in the United States? Well, again, you've got a tradition of cheap energy in this country. 
So if you got this tradition of cheap energy, are you going to really expend enough money, and it takes a tremendous amount of money, to develop carbon capture systems? Right now, in all of the coal burning power plants in the entire country, there is no modern technology for capturing carbon. No, not one. There are several hundred coal burning power plants in the country. Uh, you say carbon capture, you're talking about what? Soot? Or you talking about CO2? Carbon dioxide. CO2, okay. CO2, yeah. Which of course contributes to global warming. But now I understand recently that half of our uh, 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 Congress uh, does not believe in global warming. <laughs> what are the what, what are scientists for? Okay. Well, well, because yeah. they can only be as far back and as far forward as the recent blizzards in the last month. So global warming must not be. Well, yeah, I've got relatives this way. You know, they think, you know, global warming, if I was colder last winter than I was this winter. But, you know, uh, you familiar with the uh, the physicist Kaku, uh, K-A-K-U, uh, 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 he uh, uh, said recently when he was asked on CNN, well, why there's so, so much sun this winter? Well, here's what he said. Well, ocean warming is causing more evaporation of water into the air. So when the cold Canadian air hits, the moist air from the Gulf and Atlantic, guess what happens? Snow. So just because we've had more snow here lately does not mean global warming is not happening. Um, so uh, can you see that link there? Yes, let me see if I can share. Oh. See if you can bring it up because I've got a couple of ads that my folks refer to uh, clean tell. Okay, yeah, let me, let me see if I can. And they're short. They're like 30 seconds. Yeah. Yes, please. What's the um, difference, the benefits difference from um, the clean coal to the new Well, Nuclear energy, of course, has certain problems, but if you talk about clean energy, as far as the immediate neighborhood is concerned, it is clean energy. Nuclear is clean energy. Now, the problem is the disposal of the materials used in the reactors. Now, we have new recycling uh, um, operations to take that nuclear waste and turn it into something new. So, but otherwise, we have nuclear waste being buried inside of the mountain in the block. Is that the You mean the Yeah. Yeah, they, they've been doing that for some small zones. You know. and, well, you've got various methods. By the way, if you ever have a chance to drive to South Carolina and go up the east side of Savannah River from uh, Charleston area up towards Augusta, uh, you can see big bats sitting in the uh, Savannah it still has pot material in it that is that undergoing a uh, nuclear. You're looking at the most abundant fuel in our country. You're looking at a new. No. <laughs> this place is only 30 seconds long. Being American resource that will help us towards vital energy security into the next century. But most of all, you're looking at. So why are they running all these commercials? Trying to brainwash people into what they want. Any money? Talk. All this talk about fifty percent of our electricity is coal. In the resource that generates half of our electricity and a third. So, what they're saying about energy is absolutely correct. It is a source of energy. But there are also costs to that source of energy. And the idea that you're going to continue this path and cycle development of other technologies is ridiculous. 
It is ridiculous because they got the most of the fuel. It's the way it's so hard. You want to set the power to the water. You do your solar field. And then you bring some water in and you use an electrolysis to break down the water molecules. And what do you got? You got hydrogen oxygen. And hydrogen, of course, is used in cars as a fuel. Absolutely clean fuel on saucy be water. So, you know, there are other things that can be done. We don't have to be in a, in a state of perpetual use of these technologies that are so Same terribly part. dangerous. Heard a lot about it. So let's take a tour of it. So this guy's going to show us here a tour of a clean coal facility. In Arizona? No. <laughs> I think it's in Arizona. State of the art clean coal facility. Amazing! Machinery's kind of loud! But that's the sound of clean coal taken! <laughs> you get, there's food commercials see, for uh, clean coal. There have been several of them. Uh, uh, Move on by Oregon had, had one about three years ago. And um, so this is follows the same vein. Technology! Coal is one of the leading causes of global warming. The remarkable clean coal technology you see here changes everything. Who wants to tell the truth uh, about uh, clean coal? So you get the point. This is today's clean coal technology. Technology that's been developed in the recent activity. Say, well. We haven't developed this technology, but please to support us is, is in development. Well, again, I'll say nobody's stopping them. Proceed. But this, 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 this in any way should not hide the fact about what is actually going on. And I was just appalled when I saw that eagle flying through the air and they were talking about clean air and clean coal. And I was saying, good heaven. This just isn't right. So, hey. Well, that's my spiel. Uh, yeah. I'm so curious. Do you know what uh, what percentage of uh, electricity in Metro Atlanta comes from? Five percent. Five percent. Oh well, five percent from Mount Sacramento. But how much from coal altogether? Um. Uh, well. Most of our power, almost all of it, comes from coal burning power plants. For instance, is one of them. And uh, uh, I don't even know where the power plants are that generate. Yeah, generate Millageville, Rome, or two of them. Uh, and there's another one, I forgot where, where it is. Uh, but uh, uh, and then there is a nuclear plant down back of the But I mean, if you compare nuclear to coal, nuclear is a lot better. And France, France has done something rather unique, and they have lots of nuclear plants. And what they did essentially was to kind of perfect a plant type, and then they duplicate that exact type uh, every time they put up a new plant. So right now, the, uh, uh, France actually has cleaner energy than, than anybody, except maybe the Denmark. So what if they do the same thing? Well, same thing. Everybody else does. You either got to bury it, or you got to uh, try to recycle some of the different energy. Thank you so much. Mars, I think it's a garbage they're talking about how thanks once we use it, but it's like unsafe to use nuclear waste. And so they don't know it's Well, it is a problem. And nuclear waste is a problem. It's hot stuff. It takes hundreds of years to cool off. <laughs> and no, we don't have a real good way of dealing with it. There have been lots of proposals in the past. One I saw was take the nuclear space and uh, uh, nuclear waste and, and, and close it in glass. Then you bury the glass, and it seems like you're back to You bury something, 
you know, the barrel of the road, the glass breaks, and what? It gets in the groundwater. And that's one of the main problems with the Yucca Because you really couldn't guarantee that that is going to stay further put in. What if the Bush administration wants to do is to spend the stream? Oh no, it didn't have to go through Congress at all. Um, administrations are responsible for regulation. And basically what they can do is that when they write the rule that mines have to follow, they can essentially write the rule to sidetrack the legislation that was done in 1977 that would have required them to stay away from polluting water sources. I know it doesn't seem right at all, but that's exactly what they did. But this was not done in the Clinton administration. That is, the, the, void, the voidance the, uh, of, the, uh, of the water pollution poles in order to do Valley Hills. So uh, I, I invite you. I like you to look it up on the internet. You know, look at me thinking about that today. Tons of information about it. As well as maybe just to not run through the GPC system. There are films that you can watch too. <laughs> A lot of things on YouTube. I have a question. Yeah. Do you know um, what happens when the water goes into the Still layers on the ground. 
more layers than are available by bulldozing there. So, so there is a long future for beet mining. I've, I've heard some estimates that that if we went after all the coal that we have, you know, we could go at least 150 years in the future with the coal that's still there in beet mining. But again, I think we have to ask questions. Is this more, should we be uh, doing surface mining in particular? Well, I'm saying, but should we be starting the regulations to protect the safety of the miners of beet mining? So what is all the people that made such a big fuss in, in Alaska about oil drying and stuff? Like, are there people like that for Appalachia? Yeah, oh, yeah. Sure. You don't hear a lot about them than like the people in Alaska. Well, this film I was going to show you at the beginning, the big point. Three million gallons of coal slurry went down into the big Sandy River in Kentucky. Do you think this was reported on national TV? And the answer is no, it was not. Huge spill of toxic material on Big Sandy River. It wasn't even reported. Frankly, no one knew about it. Actually, I didn't know about it, didn't know about it until some couple, three months after it happened. And so, you know, we were reporting on the scene, and I'm afraid so, you know. <laughs> we live in Matrix, guys. I remember seeing something, I don't know where it was or when it was, where an event like this happened and there were reporters who were actually trying to get to the scene and they were blocked by the coal company officials. They were not allowed in. Yeah, that's and they tried to, at their own peril to try to serve up and get, get their cameras in and reporters that just simply could not do it. The people who work for the coal companies are very aggressive. Um, one uh, University of Kentucky graduate, you may have heard of, Ashley Judd, has been doing a lot of, of uh, seeking at National Press Club, for instance, and other places about shipping. And Ashley Judd uh, attracted the ire of the coal company employees that then published a semi-nude photo of her covering her breast and saying, well, what have I got to cover up? It was just, just nasty, nasty character assassination. So I'll show the rest of the video. I think it may have loaded by now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can get it to work, it's wonderful. <laughs> The stream is going to be here right now. Our headwaters of the stream all over the eastern United States. And if whether uh, people realize it or not, everyone is downstream here. We, we uh, the planet shares water, you know, and, and uh, if there's one drop of it polluted, then all of it's polluted. All of this is happening in a region that's a national treasure, home um, to bluegrass music and the Blue Ridge Mountains. And it's also home to more species of plants and animals than almost anywhere else on Earth outside of the tropical rainforest. <laughs> Thank you. 
It has to change. And it is it will change on an individual basis. Everybody has to stand up and fight. Everybody coming together and voicing their concern together actually you know, has to through voice and uh, make a difference and will make a difference in this fight. But it's definitely going to take a third of that. Growing up in East Tennessee, I thought the mountain would be there forever. But in my lifetime, more than 450 mountains have already been destroyed. And if we don't act, hundreds more mountains will be lost forever. To stop this, we have to remove the cloak of secrecy that's allowed it to go on. That's why we created ilovemountains.org. Thanks to new technologies like Google Earth, the coal companies can no longer hide the massive scale of destruction that they're causing. Together, we can meet America's energy needs and protect our nation's natural and cultural heritage. But it won't happen without you. Please help us spread the word. And thank you. Christopher has that, yeah, yeah. and it, yeah. it's just a little, you know, yeah. thingy. Yeah. Um, and I hope the other one has a better yeah. one. Oh. All right. I've got a meeting at 10.